Salute is a program for and about men and women who have served our country. Our program includes news about the laws that affect veterans, information on benefits and services, and news from veterans organizations. And now, our host, Bob Peters. Hello and welcome to Salute. I'm your host, Bob Peters, and with me today are two of the greatest generation ever. Bob Emick, correct? Correct. All right. I yeah. mess up names a lot. Okay, you know. yeah. But I can get this other one, John O'Brien. Right. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, I heard about you two, two gentlemen through a, a young lady that uh, you met. Her mm -hmm. name was Alice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't believe the story, so I'm glad you came today to, to, to fill us yeah, in on your, right. on your story. First, let's start with uh, Bob. Where were you uh, born and when you joined the service or you enlisted? Or? No, I was born in Pennsylvania, but I migrated to Michigan in 1940, right after I got out of high school. And uh, I, I enlisted then in October of 42, when I was 20 years old. And John? I was uh, born in 1921 in uptown Manhattan, New York City. Moved to Long Island when I was four years old. And on, went to work in a machine shop in New York. And on December 7th, the, my world was upset. And so on December 8th, I went down and enlisted in the Army. There was a friend of mine who lived in Long Island also. And he arranged for me to have an interview with people for air training. Uh, and uh, he sat me down with a major. And they spent a half an hour with me and then they decided that I was qualified for aircraft training, and they sent me home for three months. In March of 42, then, I went into Air Force training in Kelly Field in San Antonio, and uh, was commissioned in March of 1943 as a fighter pilot. And Bob, you were on uh, the Liberator, correct? I was on the Liberator, I was on the Navigator. Uh -huh. And uh, I when graduated. When you went in, where did you go first? Where did, where did you uh, have well, training? Well, they sent me to Miami for my basic training, and then I to uh, University of Tampa for, I didn't have enough education just with the high school. So they sent us there for a couple of months, and there we flew uh, Piper Cubs. And from there we went to San Antonio. <laughs> and a big uh, difference between a paper, uh, Piper Cub and the B Liberator, B-24, yeah. yeah. <laughs> big difference, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I was uh, I was in pilot training for a while, and uh, I unfortunately couldn't land an airplane. <laughs> I my uh, uh, depth perception wasn't good. Still isn't good. I hope you weren't a bombardier. <laughs> so so no so uh, uh, from there I went to uh, be a navigator. That's good. And uh, you gave you you showed me that book before that. Uh, is all about the, the, the uh, camp that you guys were on. And you, you gave me some interesting facts that uh, you were the Army Air Corps. There was 30,099 killed. Uh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, killed. And uh, wounded was 13,360 out of 32,263 aircraft. Uh, on your crew, it was 10 guys, right, Bob? 10 guys, yeah. And, uh, you were on your fifth mission. Yeah. I want to get yes. to the, later. I'm going to get to yeah. how I how I put the, we're putting the two of you together because I think that's a great story. Yeah. That you know you're both. Uh, well, let's continue with the story. Yeah. Tell us about your crew and uh, how you uh, became a POW. Well, uh, we were on a mission to uh, uh, Budapest, Hungary. Uh, there's a, a manufacturing uh, uh, island in the Danube, just uh, east of uh, Budapest. And uh, our, we were over uh, Lake Balaton, which is the biggest lake in, in, in Hungary. That was our point from which we went to the target. And we were attacked by uh, uh, ME 109s and FW 190s. And uh, we were. Uh, being attacked by a, a number of them, a lot of them. 
And nor normally, uh, you'd, you'd think that we had a lot of airplanes too, but they only picked on a, a group. And we were the last group. We were carrying incendiaries. And uh, uh, they put some shells into our, the body of the airplane, into the incendiaries, and the whole inside of the plane was on fire. It's just like a balloon torch. Mm. And uh, so when I went from the behind the pilots where I was uh, stationed, and I went down into the, opened up the door to get to the bomb bay to get out. The flames just come all the way up to the co pilot, uh, pilot and co pilot. And so uh, I had to get out of there in a hurry. And uh, 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 we were given uh, uh, harnesses that we put on. And then you were to snap on the uh, parachute. And so when you got in the airplane, you threw the parachute over on the floor where you were stationed because it would be a big thing in front of you and you couldn't, couldn't right, work right, right with it. So I went through that fire uh, and I got down between the stanchions that holds the, uh, the bombs up and it's about eight inches. So I had to go in sideways, but I had forgotten my parachute. <laughs> that, was back, that was back in the flight deck. Mm. So I had to go back for that again, and then turn around and then come back the second time. And then in order to, it had a handle on the, on the, on the parachute, and in one hand you, you had the, your hand on the handle, and the other you were, you were to snap it on. And in order for me to have two hands, I had to go between those stanchions so I didn't, the plane wasn't under control at all, it was doing all kinds of things. And I finally got one snapped, and I. Dad had turned around to get the other side out to snap it, and I couldn't do it. And the pilot came out, and he snapped it for me, and, and uh, I jumped out. <laughs> yeah, you sustained after, some injuries, too. Uh, yeah, and af after, well, yeah, after I got down, I found out I didn't have any shoes. The, they kept on going when the parachute opened, and, and uh, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't get out of my, uh, my jacket. It had melted. And I eventually, the Hungarians had to cut it off me. And uh, uh, so I, and, and part of when I got down, part of the parachute was brown where it was uh, on the verge of turning into, a, you know, the burning mm. up in the fire. And uh, so I, as we were told, I hid the parachute and uh, got my green, which way I wanted to go and started walking. And I, uh, I got to a, a, a um, I was walking in a field and, and uh, I could see these two, three, three people about uh, you know, 200 yards away waving at me. And I thought, oh, maybe friendly, you know, maybe I'm lucky. Yeah. And I got up to them, they were, I guess, farmers, three farmers. And one had a shovel and the other a shotgun the other a pitchfork. And I just walked up to him, and the guy at the shovel hit me, <laughs> knocked me flat on the back. Really? The guy with the pitchfork put it on my chest, <laughs> and then they started arguing between them. And, and then uh, uh, two soldiers sh showed up and chased them away and took me in the German nearest soldiers. town. No, Hungarians. Oh, Hungarians. All Hungarians. Hungarians. Okay. Yeah. And they took me into a little town with a, a one cell jail and put me in there until a truck came and put me in and there were more there and then the truck stopped and there were more and finally I got on a, a train and went to Budapest. And by then, my eyes are closed. Uh, they were swollen shut because I was protecting this part, you know. And, and uh, so I was in the hospital there for two months. Yeah, and you were telling me, unfortunately, uh, some of your crew was, was lost on that mission. Yes, yes. All of the, the Tail gunner, the, the ball gunner, and the two um, waste gunners were killed. Uh, when we bailed out, my pilot, when I seen him after the war, uh, said he thought there was a parachute got caught in the back of the airplane. Somebody opened it up too quick, and he thought that was me, but it was the nose gunner, mm. and he opened it up too fast. So he went down, stuck to the airplane. Right, and you were. Yeah taken to the uh, prisoner of war camp from there, right? No, no, I went in the hospital. You went to the hospital, right. And then two months later, they sent me to the, the Germans, and the Germans put me in that solitary confinement, 
where we had that little uh, eight by ten one bed, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, an interesting thing there, I guess it was, is that uh, um, for whatever reason, I, I don't know, there was a sheet of paper on a little table. And uh, after two, three days, I didn't know what to do with the paper, so I, I uh, tore it up into 52 one-inch square things, and, and with my wings, I put a one hole uh, in, in for a, a club and, and, and two holes for a heart and th three and four for the, and in the middle and one for an ace and two, and I played solitaire. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Well, let, let's talk a little bit over yeah, here yeah. to uh, yeah. John. John, you, were, you weren't in the bombers, you were fighters, right? I was in fighters, yes. Uh, immediately after graduation and, com and being commissioned as a fighter pilot, uh, I was on an airplane and wound up in the canal zone in Panama, uh, where we were defending the vital link between the oceans. Stayed down there for a couple of months and then finally wound up in North Africa. After training in P-40s and P-39s, when we got to Africa, we found out that the 39s had been taken off combat operations because they simply could not uh, fight with the 109s and the 190s. So the Eagle Squadron in England had been told that they had to, as citizens of the United States, they had to c come over to the, United, to the Army Air Force. So they formed two fighter groups, the 31st and the 52nd. We were then grounded while we, they decided what to do with us, and they decided to give us transition in Spitfires. They sent us to Constantine, Algeria, and we got five hours in Spitz and then were sent to the either the 31st or the 52nd. The 52nd went to, was in Corsica, the 31st was in Africa, and they were doing all of the breach had protection that was going on. I wound up with the 31st in Salerno and in Angio, and where we afforded beachhead protection from dawn and dark, the first and the last missions. The Germans shelled us every day, finally destroyed most of the aircraft on the beachhead, so they sent in some C-47s and took the pilots back to Castle Volturno, which was on the Rapato River. Uh, and uh, we then got more aircraft, and when we started flying again with the, covering the beachhead at Angio, uh, the first and the last missions. Other fighter groups would cover the interim missions. About the middle of March, <clears throat> I had already flown the early morning mission and was doing nothing, and the, at the light afternoon mission was ready to take off. One of the pilots turned up sick. So I was volunteered to go in the second mission of the day. We uh, were up to north of Monte Cassino, and we got contacted by the flight controller who reported a flight of uh, mixed 109s and 190s south of Rome. The, he vectored us on, uh, sent us to 25,000 feet, and vectored us on that. My belly tank would not drop off and was banging into the bottom of the aircraft, and I slowed it down to sort of get it off and finally did. But when I was, when I finally got it loose, I found out that I had, I had flown into the high cover of the Germans and was attacked by two 190s. Uh, I did the very best I could, uh, but I finally wound up hitting a Fock Wolf 190, we hit wings and sheared most of my wing off and I assume most of his. I then, the airplane would not fly, it was in, and uh, I decided to try to bail out and finally got all disconnected, flipped over, went through the canopy and finally bailed out and in so doing I hit the tail as most fighter pilots did when they bailed out they hit the rear end of the thing, and that's where their damage was going. <coughs> I didn't know that. You, you, yeah. That was a real problem, huh? That was a real problem in getting out of fighters, yes. Yeah. I opened them, I came to in the parachute. I don't remember opening, but I came to when I was in the parachute. 
my right arm was Lucius at that point, and I came down in a real open field and was picked up by German soldiers who the first thing they did was to rip open my uniform and to make certain that I had dog tags on. And because if I didn't have dog tags, I was a spy. They oh. took me down to a field hospital and the German doctors down there put me under a fluoroscope, decided that I had smashed the right shoulder and they put me in a cage like this, a wire cage, and they then sent me back to a, a, a I would guess a holding place for wounded veterans or German veterans. They sent me in with an, I was the only one that spoke in English, the rest of them spoke German. And I sat there for two or three days and I was the, the local oddity. All of the Germans who were, were there in Luz came and wanted to talk to the, to the Spitfire pilot. Finally, I, they, they sent me up to Rome and held me there as a transit. They finally got a German corporal who was going home on leave and he took me up and we walked or hitchhiked on German trucks up to Verona and then finally up into Frankfurt where they sent me into the General, the general Interrogation Center, Dulag Luft. They put me in solitary confinement there for 30 days, which I, the only reason I could, I could do that because I used my belt buckle to scratch the days on the wall and I knew that the days passed that way. I was, so I was spent about a little over 30 days in there and they finally decided they were not going to get any information out of me because I didn't have any. But the thing that bothered them was that I was an American pilot flying an English airplane and they mm. were in, interrogating me on that thing. They sent me then to the orthopedic hospital in Meiningen, Germany and I spent, an, they had to break my arm again because it had healed in the interim period and they kept me in the hospital for another month or so and then finally sent me to Stalag Luftfri in far eastern Germany and I got there and just before the 4th of July in 1944 and was there until we were released in when then we when the Russians started coming in we started went in on the, the mark and we walked out of there well uh uh, you've got a picture you want to show us. Before we go to that, I want to, uh, Bob, I want you to hold up that picture of you. There's a handsome young man there. <laughs> and you, uh, you said you got out, right? You, you, after, the, uh, after the war, you got out. So you were like, how many years, two years? Three. Three years. October 42 to December 45. Okay, well, I really thank you for your service, and you're yeah. definitely a handsome man there. You still are a handsome <laughs> no, man. No, no, never was handsome, but thanks. Yeah. Thanks, anyhow. Well, this is, where, this is where kind of you two guys kind of get together, but you don't really even know each other. But you mm -hmm. had the one thing in common. Uh, you were both in the same uh, prisoner of war camp. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, that in itself is, is interesting. What's really interesting is you, after the war, well, you stayed in a little longer, John, and uh, you guys retired, and you finally decided you wanted to get down to Florida, yeah. and you both moved into the same development, right? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Because you had no, you didn't even realize that you yeah. knew. How how did you get to uh, share your stories and know about each other? Well, Pembroke has recognizes the veterans twice a year, once on Memorial Day and once on the 11th of November. And they put on a ceremony there. So they were looking, they finally realized they had two ex prisoner wars. And I was chosen because Bob said, You do it. He says, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I represented the, the veterans of, of World War II who were missing in action. Mm -hmm. And uh, I represented them. And that's how we, uh, we finally met because of that. Those ceremonies were put on by Pembroke every year. Every year. Yeah, that had to be something. Oh yeah, I was there. Yeah, you were there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, that okay. photo you brought? And uh, this is a the aerial view of 
Stalaglov 3. We were in the center compound, which was not in the center. It was off to, the, to my left-hand side, if you look at this thing. But the, the point that I was demonstrated here, that we got parcels theoretically every week, but only at the convenience of the German government. And in those, one of the, some of the parcels contained playing cards. These were special playing cards in that they were, had been split and an escape map had been put into the 52 cards. If you split the cards out and you pulled out a portion of the escape map and then put it all together, you had an escape map that might tell you how to get out of Germany if you ever got out of Stalagluf III. Uh, this was a technique that was invented by the, some people in the United States. The method of doing it has been lost, and nobody has bothered about doing it again for the people who had to escape in later wars. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so you put these cards together and it'll show you the escape route to get mm -hmm. out. Did the Germans ever catch on to that? No, no. the Germans no. never no. knew about that. I have, a, I have a whole set of cards that way. It shows oh, really? the map in the back, yeah. yeah. One of our reunions, the card company, uh, made enough for the people that came to the reunion. Well, that's what must be interesting to see. Yeah, I could have brought that, too. Well, you always come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. You always come back, yeah. Thank you for allowing me to show that. Well, thank you for sharing that with yeah. us. Uh, you know, you, you think of these uh, prisoner war camps, and, of course, a lot of younger people think, oh, Hogan's Heroes, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, but I, I, you can assure me it wasn't like that, right? No, 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 it wasn't. We, we were, you know, this is where the Great Escape took place. And that took place, I think it was in April, wasn't it, of 40, uh, 44? Yeah. And, and why, I wasn't there at the time. Mm -hmm. The results of that, I was a part of. Uh, the Germans, uh, our commander of the, the German that ran the thing, he got sent to Russia, you know. And they brought all new people in, and they didn't give us uh, a lot of the things that they were getting before the everything clamped down, put it that way. Mm. Food and clothes and, and everything else. Uh, they weren't happy. They weren't happy with no, us. So not. we went through that part. So you, you, you both finally, uh, you got liberated at the same time or no? Oh, yeah. So oh, yes, we were together yeah. because yeah. Yeah. And, uh, when... When the Russians were coming in, the Germans decided to move us out of Stalagluf III. We went out there, what was it, in late January? January 20, 29, I think, January 29. Yeah, and it was, we went out of there in the midst of a, a blinding snowstorm, and we walked for 50 well. or 60 kilometers over a couple of days, freezing. The thing that I do have to mention is that when we came to a town, the only place that we could be housed was usually a church, and the church people took us and allowed us to go into those things, and they, they were very kind to us in doing that. They helped us survive, because uh, we were walking in, in the snow, uh, we were walking without proper clothing, some of us were walking with shoes that had very little left of, of the shoes and soles because the Germans weren't giving us any shoes anymore. That kept us immobile. Yeah. And so, what? Those, those three things. There were. We had. There was a lot of sympathy extended to the people by the people on the march. The thing. The second thing I like to mark that as we marched along, that even the German soldiers realized that the war was over, so they were getting rid of their uniforms and their stripes and their guns and everything else, and they became Americans too. Oh yeah, even though they couldn't speak English. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you, you, yeah. you at, at the end of this uh, march, where they marched you to, uh, what was there? The well, they finally the mar walked us down to a railroad head, and they put us in boxcars, forty and eight, and they packed us in so you couldn't move, you couldn't do anything, you, you learned to sleep standing up, and there was no food or anything else. And they try, they sent us down then into southern Germany. Did you go down to Moosburg right away? Moos Moosburg, Stalag yeah. 7. Moosburg, Germany is where we yeah. found out well enough. We Stalag 7A. Yeah. And we, still, we were freed then by Patton's army, mm -hmm. who came in there finally on the, again, what was the date on that? 
I think it was the 29th of April. 20 yeah, 29th He's of April. He's got great memory. Yeah, America I finally got I in. I can't remember where I was yesterday. Yeah, I rely on him for all the data. Yeah, you're doing <laughs> great. You guys are doing good with it, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Then, you, then they got you uh, a 40 and 8, by the way. That's a, that's a, yeah. a box car. Yeah, yeah, you know, but that's the uh, part 40, of the American. 40, 40 soldiers or 8 horses. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's the uh, association some, within the American Legion. It's yeah. part of the American yeah. 40 Legion. That's right. You yeah. can't ask to be a member of that. They, ha they have to ask you. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. so you got on the plane, you got home. Well, they sent us to Camp Lucky Strike, which on the uh, uh, the coast of France, and they tried to de louse us and humanize us there a little bit, and they <laughs> finally put us on boats and sent us back because we had a priority for return to the United States by being yeah. ex-prisoners of war. I mm -hmm. I got off at Fort Dix. You probably did the same. Yeah. And, and, and that was about May 20th or something. So you can see it didn't take them long to get us home. Yeah. yeah. And you like we, when we were liberated at 829 with Patton's people, they had to leave us right away because they were going further on. And we were, we were about four or five days sitting there waiting for something to happen. They finally took us to an airport and put us in C-47s to, to France. But when you take four or five days there, a week or two in France, and a boat across, May 20, 24th or something, I was home. <laughs> That's quick. Really <laughs> glad too, right? Oh yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Was, you, was your treatment? Did they how did they treat you? All right, or was it uh, you know? Well, hungry and cold. <laughs> yeah. I always say that they. We we on the on the church thing. That was just one night. We were in fields and barns at other times. And, and uh, the first night we stayed at that church thing, we were laying on the floor and everywhere else, and, and, and uh, we were told by the, the colonel that was in charge of our compound, uh, American colonel, and he said, take your shoes off, don't sleep with your shoes on. So I, <laughs> I got up in the morning and my shoes were frozen. I had to, I'd take all the laces off it in order to get my feet in them. Wow. <laughs> so I never took those shoes off until I got down to Stalag 7A. <laughs> wow. So just, just i got to wrap this up because we're running out of time. Okay. So you guys went home and you went on your careers afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you did six years, you said, John. And uh, you decided to move to Florida and you wind up in Pembroke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right next to each other. Yeah. I mean, and same block. how many years after was that? I mean, that's like what sixty some odd years or something. Oh, yeah. well, from nineteen forty-five until whenever you moved last in year, until the, two years ago, moved here and well, so that's fifty-five or sixty years. I, you're, I, you're a good arithmetic. Uh, I, 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 I lived in Pembroke of a number of years before I knew about John. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No one talked about uh, the veterans or, or the POWs or anything until we started having those meetings. Mm. Uh, well, if you come, you go back to Pembroke, you tell everybody <laughs> how you enjoyed being on Salute. Give me some more yeah. veterans to come on here because oh. we really enjoy yeah. hearing uh, your tale of, yeah. uh, was, you know, and it, it's heroic yeah. tale. And I'm, I'm very yeah. proud to have met you guys. Yeah. I want to thank you for coming on the show, yeah. but I am out of time. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one quick thing, you were telling me that uh, that uh, concentration camp, there was like 12,000 prisoners of war there? 11,000. 11,000, yes. wow. Mostly American. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you for your service, gentlemen. I do appreciate you coming on. Okay. But thank we're you, out sir. of time. So to all our veterans out there, our active military and yeah. their families, we salute you. Till next time. Yeah. Thank you. We are now entering our third year salute here at Lakefront TV. We've had many great guests and veterans organizations share their stories with us. We'd like to hear from you too. If you're a veteran or veterans organization, Lake Sumner counties, please give us a call. Lakefront TV can be seen all over Lake County and the villages and worldwide at lakefronttv.com.